Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar co-produced by Child Family Community Australia and Emerging Minds. It's entitled How to Recognise Complex Trauma in Infants and Children and Promote Wellbeing. My name is Chris Dolman. I work with Emerging Minds National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health and I'm delighted to be bringing you this uh, webinar today. It was originally broadcast in August 2021 but we're rebroadcasting it this month um, well, for a number of reasons. Of course, it was very uh, popular at the time um, and it's still obviously a very uh, significant uh, issue uh, as the recent Australian child maltreatment study uh, bore out. Uh, it's also a very important topic we know for our regular audiences to this uh, webinar series. And um, uh, just recently Emerging Minds has released some further resources in relation to this theme. So we're uh, keen to ensure people know about those as well. You'll be able to um, find links to those in the resources uh, tab sheet. So um, yeah, as we proceed, uh, Emerging Minds and CFCA would like to recognise and pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the lands on which we work and play and walk on throughout this country. We acknowledge and respect their traditional connections to their land and waters, culture, spirituality, family and community for the well-being of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and their families. And of course, the many skills and knowledges that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families uh, bring to the care and well-being of uh, children that we can all learn from. So uh, let's uh, have a look at the learning objectives, which will really be guiding the presentation today. Uh, so the learning objectives are to explore the evidence behind the prevalence and effects of complex trauma on early childhood development and wellbeing. Also how to uh, recognise and respond to the effects of complex trauma uh, in practice with infants and children and, and their parents and caregivers. And also how to have preventative and early intervention conversations with parents and caregivers about uh, their children's wellbeing. So uh, yeah, just in terms of uh, housekeeping, a couple of things to be mentioning right now. There will be a survey that you'll have the opportunity to complete at the end of the webinar. It'd be great if you could spend a couple of minutes doing that. That helps us uh, ultimately get better at uh, what we do. Also, the resources and presenter uh, bios uh, can be found on the resources tab. And this recording will be posted on the AFE website in a few weeks. So yeah, just to note too, a couple of things that because this is a uh, rebroadcast, then um, uh, to mention that the speakers have moved on from their uh, roles at the time when they were speaking, and also that there's no live uh, Q and A time either. But uh, yeah, for now, let's uh, let's go to the recording. All right, so it's, uh, yeah, it's my pleasure uh, to um, uh, introduce our uh, presenters for today. Um, you've already uh, seen the bios that we distributed uh, for our guests. Um, so I'd like to yeah, uh, welcome Trina Hinkley, Ali Knight and Catherine Linton uh, to the panel today. And rather than getting a, a restating of the, uh, the bios, um, I thought I'd just begin by um, uh, yeah, welcoming. So welcome Catherine, welcome Ali. And, um, Perhaps if you could just begin, maybe we'll start with you, Ali, um, in terms of uh, you know, this area of work, working with children in relation to, to trauma, what is it about this area of work that kind of continues to draw you to it? You know, what is it that um, you find most engaging or interesting about this aspect of practice? Oh, hi everyone. Um, Chris, I think for me, um, I, what I really appreciate and enjoy about working with infants and young children is that it's an exciting time in a child's life in terms of you can really bring about some change when there has, you know, there has been traumatic events. It doesn't mean that um, you can't sort of help shape a child's trajectory in a positive direction. So it's a really, um, yeah, it's a window of very exciting change. So I'd, I've just seen that time and time again, and it's, it keeps me sort of, you know, very hopeful and enthused about the work I do. Yeah, great. Yeah, really sustaining. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, thanks, Natalie. Look for, looking forward to your contribution shortly. Yeah. And Catherine, welcome to you as well. Um, uh, perhaps the, if I could ask you a similar question, really, and what is it about this area of practice that yeah, continues to sort of interest you and draw you into it? 
Oh, thanks, Chris, and thank you so much for having me on the panel. It's such an honour to be here. Um, similar to Ali, I, I find the work incredibly rewarding. It's a real privilege to be able to be working with children and their important adults to, to help them live their best life. And similar to what Ali said, it is such an honour to be able to support children, to be able to, to manage tough times and to, to be able to develop and grow resilience. And it's it's such a joy to be able to um, work with children and learn from children and their wisdom as well. Great, thanks Catherine. And again, we're looking forward to yeah, your contribution a bit later in this hour as well. So, um, and our third panelist, um, Trina Hinckley. Um, as it turns out, Trina um, was not able to join us live today, but um, I love it when a plan B uh, comes off. And so Trina's actually uh, pre-recorded her presentation. And uh, so we'll, um, We'll uh, listen to that presentation now and then uh, followed by Ali and Catherine after that. So um, please, uh, this is a um, presentation that Trina for, um presented a few, a few days ago. Hi everyone, I'm Trina Hinckley from the Australian Institute of Family Studies and I'm just going to talk a little bit at the start of this webinar on this really important topic about what complex trauma actually is. Um, and some of the nuances that we need to consider when we're thinking about complex trauma, including some of the protective factors and some of the impacts that you might see in a child if they've been exposed to complex trauma. So to start with, um, complex trauma occurs when a child repeatedly uh, has experiences of extreme and severe stresses or traumatic events over an extended period of time. So this is not just one stressor, one or two stressors or traumatic events, this is multiple events over an extended period of time. And the term complex trauma is actually used to refer to the experience of the traumatic events themselves. So it's not used to refer to the symptoms that a child might present with if they've experienced complex trauma. Complex trauma can result in both short and long-term effects for the child. The most common types of, of traumatic events that a child might experience in Australia that would contribute to their experience of com complex trauma include physical, sexual and emotional abuse, neglect or exposure to domestic or family violence. In other contexts, children might also be exposed to community violence or medical trauma, but those are less common in Australia. When we think about complex trauma, it's really important to consider that the experience of complex trauma will affect every child differently and their experience will be based on a number of factors. For instance, we know that the negative effects of complex trauma are more likely to be long-term and severe when the trauma occurs early in the child's life, so when they're younger rather than when they're older, the effects will be more severe if they experience a longer duration of trauma as opposed to a shorter duration of trauma. And the effects will be more severe if they experience multiple forms of trauma and not just one form of trauma. And the final consideration is that the symptoms that the child presents with are their coping strategies. They're their mechanisms for being able to or trying to manage their experience of complex trauma. That's their adaptations to their environment. In terms of protective effect or protective factors, there are a number of these and most of them revolve around the primary caregiver or other caregivers but some extend beyond that as well. So a really strong protective factor is having at least one stable and responsive caregiver who is able to apply really positive parenting practices into the child's life. It's also protective for a child if they have a caregiver who believes in and validates their experience of trauma rather than negating or trying to minimise it. And a caregiver who's able to self-regulate their emotions is important. And this matters because when children see a caregiver self-regulate their emotions, that acts as a model to them. So they can then try and adopt that self-regulation themselves. So it helps them learn self-regulation of their own emotions. 
One other protective factor for a child is having a positive social support network that can bring emotional support to the child's life when they need it. So I'll move on now to talk about the impacts on the child's body and brain and I'll talk primarily about the child's stress response system and their brain and developmental skills. So with respect respect to the child's stress response system, when a child experiences complex trauma, their stress response system is likely to be excessively and repeatedly activated. So that means that this normal cycle of activation and deactivation, which is normal and healthy in any individual, is not able to occur in a child experiencing complex trauma because they're in this heightened state of activation for extended periods of time. And that can actually disrupt the development and regulation of the child's stress responses which can lead to the child exhibiting either blunted responses where they underreact compared to a child of similar developmental stage or they might exhibit exaggerated responses where they over overreact to a stimuli compared to a child of a similar developmental stage changes to the child's stress response system can also increase their vulnerability to later mental health problems such as high levels of stress and later health problems such as hypertension. With respect to the child's brain development, we know that there are sensitive or critical periods during which different parts of the child's brain are developing and growing more rapidly than at other times. If a child experiences complex trauma during one of these times, the child may be more susceptible to impacts from the trauma than at other periods of their development. Some of the symptoms that you might see or that a child might present with include social, emotional and behavioural difficulties. And children might also uh, present with developmental difficulties such as speech, language or cognitive difficulties. So if we think a little bit about the changes in developmental skills, one aspect could be delayed language skills. So children might have an impaired ability to listen, an impaired ability to be able to understand what's being conveyed to them, or they may have delays or impairments in their ability to speak. With respect to children's cognitive skills, children who experience complex trauma may have problems with attention or concentration. They might have challenges to their higher level planning and reasoning skills, or they might have impacts on their cognitive ability or their IQ. So I'll move on now to the possible impacts of complex trauma on children's behaviours. And these include how a child might respond in a situation and impacts on their health behaviours. So with respect to how a child might respond, Normal responses to a stressful situation are primarily fight or flight. So we turn around to attack or we turn around to run away. Children generally don't have access to those responses because of their age and the environments in which they are. So instead they might turn to a dissociative response, a freeze response, or um, appear as though they're numbed or disengaged. And sometimes this can be interpreted as attention problems or daydreaming, but it's really important to remember that this might be a child's only defence to the complex trauma that they're actually experiencing. And children might present with changes in their levels of arousal or vigilance. So they might be overly aroused where they're more easily startled by stimuli in their environment than a child of a similar developmental stage or were they overly alert or vigilant to potential threats in their environment? Or children might be might present with under arousal where they are experiencing and exhibiting those dissociative features such as the numbing and disengaging behaviours where they have a lower level of response or arousal to stimuli. Children might also experience changes in response to sensory stimuli such as touch or sound and this might be particularly evident if they are trauma or triggers to the trauma that the child's experienced. 
With respect to changes in children's behaviours, um, some of the things that they might present with could include sleep disturbances. So they may not want to go to bed. They may have difficulty falling asleep. They may have nightmares or night terrors or changes in their feeding and eating behaviours. And this could include uh, behaviours like hoarding, where they're trying to have some control over their environment or overeating or undereating behaviours. So I'll move on to changes in the child's well-being, and these can include impacts on attachment, social well-being and emotional well-being. When we look at attachment, complex trauma can compromise the development of the attachment relationship between the child and the caregiver. And this is most likely to happen if the complex trauma occurs within the context of that child caregiver relationship, or if the complex trauma is perceived as a threat to that child caregiver relationship. If children have difficulties with attachment in their child caregiver relationship, this could present as difficulties in separating from the parents, so they might be clingy. There might be inconsistent behaviours towards the parent or caregiver, so this could be alternately clingy or dismissive or aggressive towards the caregiver, or they might lack trust towards the caregiver, so they may have lower levels of eye contact and less engagement with the caregiver than you would expect from a child of a similar developmental stage. With, response to the, with respect to the child's social wellbeing, this could be uh, impacted in terms of their ability to form relationships and friendships. And this could present as children distrusting other people or being very vigilant or guarded when they're interacting with other people. Children might also experience problems in relating to authority figures such as teachers or educators, and they may struggle with their social skills, which of course also impact their ability to form friendships. And in terms of children's emotional well-being, children may be hyper-responsive to angry facial features if they've experienced complex trauma. They may have difficulty in self-soothing I find that word so difficult to say. Um, and they might be susceptible to triggers for traumatic memories. And this might be particularly evident in terms of their inability uh, to, Im to regulate their emotions, particularly if they're experiencing a high level of negative emotions. So I've just touched at a really high level on some of the considerations around complex trauma. I'm sure Catherine and Ali will do a fabulous job of providing a lot of rich depth and context to their experiences with, in dealing with complex trauma. And I would really encourage you to read some of the resources that Emerging Minds have on this topic. Great, well, I've really appreciated um, uh, the way Trina set to set of context really for some of our discussions around uh, around practice and responding to families where children have experienced a complex trauma. And so um, now I'd like to invite uh, Ali to uh, continue the presentation now. So yeah, thanks Ali. Hi everyone. Um, I, I wanted to um, start off by just uh, talking a bit about um, the relationship with um, between a child and their caregiver um, when they've experienced trauma. So when we think about an infant or a young child, the relationship with a caregiver is their environment. So um, the, the recovery process is really dependent on the quality of care they provide. So we know that uh, infants and young children are really sensitive to their caregiving environments. So, um, and Trina touched on this point in her presentation just now, that if a parent is able to provide sensitive care that is developmentally appropriate and the caregiver is able to provide the stability and consistency, then for that infant or young child, the recovery process is gonna be much smoother. So, um, and the other thing I think that is worth keeping in mind is that um, the relational patterns that we establish early in life, so um, for that infant or young child, um, you know, they'll go on 
and you know have those sort of patterns going forward and that it's 80 percent predictive of relationships through life um, that are really established in that early kind of um, early few years so um, you can sort of see the importance of, of of that environment for the infant so the other thing I wanted to touch on was um, if you're thinking about a young child or an infant who've experienced trauma um, this this could be a shared trauma, so it could be that the parent has also experienced um, the traumatic events, uh, and an example of that might be domestic violence. So if this is the case, it's it's really important that um, the parent also has access to therapeutic support, because then they'll be in a much better place to support their child's recovery. And the other thing you know that is also really, really important is that um, thinking about the parents' own experiences. So they may have had uh, traumatic experiences in their in their childhood. And, you know, I think as clinicians, if we make space for that story to be heard and understood, um, then that child, that young child is going to, again, have a, um, a better recovery process. Because if a parent can reflect on their own experiences, then um, you know they can they can we find that they're better able to make sense of of the experience their child has had so um, and you know that's going to be protective for that that child in the future for any um, from experiencing any further trauma and you know for that child going forward for their recovery um, I thought it would be worth mentioning that if anyone's interested in finding out a little bit more um, I would recommend that you look at uh, you just to look on YouTube for videos of Alicia Lieberman talking about ghosts in the nursery, uh, which is really a way of understanding how the parents' early experiences of, um, of parenting, which might be you know, harsh or traumatic experiences, are present in how they're parenting their child. So um, I wanted to go on to talk about um, you know, when, you do, when you're working therapeutically with an infant or a young child, um, you know, a really important part of the work is helping the parent um, sort of think about the child's experience, so around the parent's capacity uh, to make sense of the child's behaviours in terms of what the, the trauma that the child's experienced. So it's quite complex work, really, because um, I'm sure, as a lot of you can probably appreciate, you, you as a therapist, you're engaging in a relationship with the infant or the young child and also with their parent. But you're also um, keeping in mind and thinking about the relationship between the parent and the infant. So, because when when there's been trauma, and Trina did touch on this in her presentation, that um, that often impacts on that um, parent-infant relationship. So it's really important as part of the work um, to recover that you're supporting um, that parent-infant relationship. Um, because that's going to be very protective for the infant or the young child as they go forward in their life. So the quality of the therapeutic relationship um, that you establish with the with the, the family is, is so important. And so for uh, if you're thinking about the parent, if they you know in their relationship with you, if they feel uh, understood, if they feel supported, and you know contained then they're gonna be in a, um, a much better position to provide that for their child. So um, when we think about trauma, it often, what happens is it can rupture the protective shield um, that you know, may um, have been in place um, that the parent sort of um, in the parent-child relationship. So if you're thinking about um, that sense of grown-ups being bigger, stronger, wiser and kind. So we're really, um, want to do that work around the parent and child relationship um, to assist in the repair uh, when it's safe to do so. The other thing I wanted to, to um, touch on is that uh, it's a really important as part of working with trauma for young children and for, for any person, but when we're thinking about infants and young children, to make meaning of, um, you know, for the experience. So, if, so when people can tell a coherent story about they've been, what they've been through, they tend to do better. So for young children, it's not necessarily um, like a linear type of, um, in a linear way or a narrative, you know, you know, this happened and then that happened. Sometimes it's, it's more often like around themes. So, and that 
um, you know, the children will express that in their play. Uh, so making space for that, you know, that, that play to occur is really important. Um, but around, around that, um, being, you know, the child being able to regulate their emotions is really important as well. So, uh, and again, it's about, um, you know, the parent being able to support their child to regulate um, and then, you know, they can do the important work they need to do. One thing about trauma is it's very powerful learning. So um, it's, it's worth thinking about um, what, what did that experience of trauma teach the child? So sometimes it's about, um, you know, children will then be questioning because of the traumatic experience, can I trust you? Uh, will you leave me? Will you hurt me? Am I lovable? Am I capable? So we really need to be thinking about um, restorative experiences after trauma and um, children and you know, um, infants learning something different and experiencing something different. So, um, you know, every interaction that children have um, with us, they're learning. So um, they need to sort of experience something else um, over and over again so they know they can count on us. So that's, um, you know, where we need to be thinking about repetition of experiences over and over. And so in connection with that, um, trauma also can impact on um, what we can uptake in terms of positive experiences. So um, that's another reason why repetition uh, in terms of the recovery process is so important. And so it's often worth thinking about that in relation to um, yourself as a therapist and the space that you're creating for your work with infants and young children. So, you know, little things can really be important. So making your sessions the same time, the same day, the same place, having the room set up in the same way, all those things are really important um, for, for children's um, feeling safe and their recovery from trauma. So um, I wanted to share an example. The other thing is in terms of how you are as um, in your interactions and your presentation in your work with the young child and the, and the parent is really important. And um, one family I worked with, um, with a, a baby and a, and a mum is just, I think just highlights that in terms of, um, this is a mum who had a very emotionally abusive parent in her upbringing. And so there was a, um, an element of unpredictability. So she never sort of knew how her mum was going to present. And this continued on to her adult life and her adult relationship with her mum. But she shared with me um, that the work that we did in therapy, she, she, so she said that when um, she knew every time she came in that I would be the same. And that was really important for her um, that I was sort of, you know, she, she had such unpredictability in her family relationships that just um, knowing that I'd be, you know, calm and, you know, available to her was really important in terms of her feeling um, supported and contained. And then, you know, going on to, she could then provide that for her, her baby. So lastly, I've, I've shared a lot of, um, I guess, of my learnings, but I wanted to just um, refer you to, and this is attached as one of the resources in, for this webinar, there's 12 principles of early childhood development that, um, that I find really, really helpful um, in my work with um, infants and young children. So this is, these principles have been developed by Alicia Lieberman um, and they're just a really useful thing to keep in mind when you're working with trauma. Um, so um, I won't go through them all, but I just wanted to touch on a couple that are, um, are really useful. Um, for example, thinking about young children um, crying and clinging in terms of this is their way of communicating their immediate need for the parents' uh, closeness and care. Uh, and if we think about separation distress as an expression of the child's fear of losing their parent. Um, another one is that um, you know young children will imitate their parents' behaviour because they want to be like them and they assume that the parents' behaviour is a model to emulate. So you can see that that's really a useful uh, principle when you think about, for example, the context of domestic violence and how children might be acting out aggressively if they've seen that in the home. And lastly, I wanted to highlight, um, you know, the one around memory. So memory starts at birth and we know that babies and young children can remember experiences long before they can speak about them. 
So yeah, they're storing them and that's, I guess, why, you know, play is such an important way for young children to be able to express um, their experiences and, and how they feel. So thanks everyone, that's, that's all from me. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Ali, for being very uh, generous in sharing some of your learnings um, with us uh, today. And uh, there's been a number of questions coming in that I'll hopefully get a chance to uh, ask you a bit about later, particularly in relation to supporting uh, parents, among other things. But uh, so thank you for that. Um, and Catherine, uh, over to you. We'd love to hear some more about your some of your learnings and uh, practice wisdom that's come about on account of engaging with um, uh, children and families. Uh, thank you so much, Chris, and um, really interesting insights from Trina and Ali. Um, I'd like to begin by also paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on and pay my respects to elders past and present. I extend a warm welcome to any First Nations participants that join us today. But I must acknowledge that the research and ideas that I'll be referencing come from the perspective of Western medicine and do not fully take into account the impact of colonisation and intergenerational trauma that's been experienced by First Nations people. As we've heard, the impact of developmental trauma is far reaching on children's brain development, their relationships, their ability to play and learn and on their mental health. I really encourage continued learning and professional development and the resource list will provide you with plenty of options for further learning. And self-care really is a must for anyone who's working with a child with trauma, who's supporting a child with trauma, or has experienced trauma in their own childhood. Ongoing professional learning and external supports are essential. As the saying goes, we can't pour from an empty cup. I encourage you to look at small steps forward as being a win. It's so important to celebrate these wins because within the wins hold hope and within hope there's healing. Some of the people who we work with wonder with us about why developmental trauma that has occurred prenatally or in infancy or in early childhood has such an impact on children's mental health and into adulthood, particularly as infants and young children won't explicitly remember abuse. The way I understand it is that one of the answers is in the difference between implicit and explicit memory and brain development, which Ali just touched on. Explicit memory relates to things that we can relatively easy, easily recall. Implicit memory is unconscious and unintentional, like how we remember to ride a bike after years of not practicing. Implicit memory includes feelings and feelings can exist in utero, but humans don't start forming the explicit memories till around the age of three. We may not remember traumatic events, but the body remembers the feelings. If early childhood feelings are dominated by fear, confusion, anxiety, or even terror, the body continues to hold these memories into later childhood and into adulthood. The human brain is incredibly adaptive to its environment, particularly in infancy and early childhood. The brain is wired to predict and respond to threat in order to increase the chance of survival. The experience of trauma can impact the development of the brain's ability to regulate emotions and can disrupt mood, which can lead to mental health issues in childhood and adulthood. Trauma can literally change the structure and function of the brain. A psychiatrist, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk book so clearly articulates the body keeps the score. It's a really excellent resource, which I highly recommend for further information about the experience of body-based trauma memories. When we're supporting a child, we often consider their age when making assessments. This is particularly important for a child who has experienced trauma. Developmental tasks, milestone and chronological ages for children are connected but separate. Chronological age relates to how many months or years old a person is. Developmental tasks are different to developmental milestones. Milestones are related to physical activities that a child can and can't do yet. For example, being able to hold up their head or to wave. Developmental tasks though are more complex. And I'll just invite Chris to pop up the first slide. 
Um, for the purposes of, of what I'm about to talk about, I'm referencing the developmental tasks that are described by the Synergetic Play Therapy Institute, which focuses on a child's internal world and sense of self. There is this resource that's available on the resource list. As you can see on the slide, developmental tasks can correlate with a child's age. However, trauma can impact on a child's ability to fulfill developmental tasks. These developmental tasks help us understand a child's internal world and how it might be impacted by the experience of trauma. For, for mental health clinicians and medical staff, the use of psychometric assessments can be useful in documenting and understanding the impact of trauma. However, these assessments should be taken as part of a wider assessment. And psychometric assessments often do not take into account cultural difference, the impact of colonization and intergenerational trauma. So it should be used with caution. It is important to consider a child's worldview and how their experiences have shaped their world, which is sometimes referred to as the child's trauma world versus the now world. The trauma world is the world that a child's brain has adapted to in order to make sense of the world and how to survive it. A child's trauma world is influenced by many things, including the trauma itself, the developmental stage in which they experienced it, and who, if anyone, was able to soothe and protect them during a traumatic experience. A child's brain adapts to the trauma world and they can develop templates based on their experience, such as, I can't trust anyone, no one will look after me, or will I ever have enough food to eat? A child's brain is so wise and smart as it adapts to scary and unpredictable situations. The child's brain does not automatically shift once they're in a physically safe environment. An environment where an adult is not abusive can seem super strange and scary to a child who's experienced abuse. An adult saying, you're safe now, you can trust me, won't hold weight for an abused child. Their brain has developed clever ways of keeping them safe. And as Ali was saying, they need to be shown over and over and over again that their now world can be trusted. A child who's experienced developmental trauma has developed lots of ways to survive and they're not going to be easily tricked into letting down their guard. It's so important to remember that a child would need hundreds, if not thousands of repetitions of safety before their brain allows them to feel safe. Physical safety does not equate to a felt sense of safety. That comes with loads of patience, care and attunement. And I'll just invite Chris to pop up the next slide for me. The experience of developmental trauma can manifest in symptoms that look like other diagnoses. For example, a child with developmental trauma might have challenges with attention and impulse control that can look like ADHD, or they might have a strong need for control and challenges with their social relationships that can look like autism. This is not to say that a diagnosis is not correct, or a child with developmental trauma doesn't have a medical condition. However, it is to invite a stronger consideration to the impact of trauma on a child's developing brain. To illustrate this point, I'm referencing a Venn diagram developed by clinical psychologist, Dr. Susan Checker. The overlap of symptoms and experiences between trauma, ADHD and autism is significant and should not be considered in isolation from each symptom set. The approach, regardless of whether a child has ADHD, autism or trauma, or all three, is the same. The felt sense of safety that occurs in relationship is what all children need. Children's brain grows within relationship. They are able to be their best selves when they feel safe. I strongly encourage people to use the PACE approach by Dr. Dan Hughes and read the work of Dan Hughes and Dr. Tina Payne Bryson on therapeutic parenting, particularly the books, The Whole Brain Child and No Drama Discipline, 
These are suggested in the resource list. The PACE approach that I've just mentioned might be familiar or it might be a new idea. PACE is based on developmental attachment theory and is a model for relationship development and trauma resolution. It's particularly helpful to practice PACE with children who have developmental trauma. PACE stands for playful, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy. Children learn through play, so we need to be playful. When we accept a child for where they're at, we are standing in non-judgment. When we can be curious about a child's feelings, we are connecting with them and teaching them regulation. And when we have empathy, we're offering them a safe place to land. We must connect with a child before we correct them. Some examples of pace sentence starters might be, I wonder if you're feeling sad because I said no to more TV, or it's really hard when I say no to more sweets, or is that you trying to say hello to me? In the words of Kim Golding and Dan Hughes, pace does not compromise discipline. It empowers discipline. If you're interested in learning more, I'd really encourage you to have a look at the resource list and also considering, consider registering for some of the professional learning that's available. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you on this webinar. And please remember to take care of yourself as you care for others and celebrate those wins. They really matter. Thank you. Right, thanks very much, Catherine. Again, really a generous sharing of uh, learning and uh, practice wisdom that uh, you've generated through your experience and um, I guess uh, through the contribution of people you've worked with as, as well. So thank you so much uh, for that. And, um, and thanks to everyone that's, um, uh, that's been uh, sending through uh, questions uh, for both of our uh, panelists today. So we're going to move on and um, ask uh, some of those questions of both um, Ali and, um, and Catherine. Actually, Ali, as I mentioned, there were um, a number of questions coming through in relation to um, supporting parents when working with children. Um, uh, and I think you've touched on some of these themes already as you continue to speak, but one of them was a bit about, like, practitioners are concerned about shaming parents, inadvertently shaming parents by talking with them about children. So. There's questions around the theme was, you know, how, how to talk to parents about uh, children's, you know, uh, behaviour being a result of trauma, you know, without, without shaming or, or blaming the parent, you know, without making them perhaps feel guilty that they hadn't taken action earlier, perhaps, those kind of, those kind of things. So, yeah, do you have some, um, some thoughts in relation to that? Yeah, I think that's a really tricky, um, it's a great question. Um, I think it's a it's a tricky thing, isn't it? Because you don't want to, um, you know, make a, a, you don't want to contribute to a parent feeling worse about um, the situation that they probably already are. So for me, I suppose it's just, um, I would really, I think if you, um, as I talked about in my presentation, it's really about the relationship that you're forming with the, the parent that will allow some of those difficult conversations to happen. So, um, and, and you know, building up that trust um, in the relationship. So uh, I suppose if you do have that, um, the relationship where you can then sort of start to uh, have some kind of tougher conversations, but also, you know, I think for me, it's, it's important when I'm um, in a therapeutic relationship with a family to, if I if I get a sense that okay I've I've actually um, I've maybe said something that's a bit too confronting then I will just acknowledge that as like I'm really sorry that that you know what I've said has actually con um, you know contributed to how you're feeling right now and I, I apologise for that so it's about sort of just a bit of um, um, you know trying to have uh, conversations that are open and honest I suppose about the child's experience but in a way that um, supports the parent where they're at and to, um, you know, I suppose um, it's, it is important for the, the, the parent to be able to take some um, responsibility for where they're at, but also not in a way that they feel helpless or powerless about moving forward. So you, it's, a, it's a bit of a fine line really. So um, it's, it's a complex, complex thing, isn't it really? So but I think, you know, it just comes back to the quality of the relationship you've got and spending time to really um, to
to do that before you sort of, mm. you know, uh, <laughs> charge you yeah. there and, and say yeah. something that's too challenging. If that makes sure. sense, Chris? Yeah, that certainly does make sense, yeah. Mm. Okay. Was there anything else you wanted to add to that um, in relation to, um, you know, mitigating a, a parent's sense of uh, shame in relation to uh, the effects of trauma on their child? Sure, and I um, I completely agree with what Ali said. I think she's mm -hmm. made some lovely points. Um, I think to build on what Ali said, I think it's important to understand the the felt difference between shame and blame. Um, blame might be I've done something bad, or shame is I am bad. And I think shame can be really prevalent for, with people who have experienced trauma, and they might be more vulnerable to experiencing shame. I think um, being very gentle and respectful as Ali indicated, but um, some of the things that I do when I'm talking with parents is I'm trying to think with them in terms of offering a concept or an idea and then wondering with them what, it, what they might think about that or how would they use that if they were gonna use that idea um, okay. and, and acknowledging that it's, it might be a new practice. Um, I hope that makes sense. It certainly does, yeah. No, thank you both uh, for those responses. Um, uh, there's some other questions actually picking up a bit on you know that uh, that diagram, uh, the second one that you uh, shared, Catherine, in relation to these kind of intersections between um, tra trauma and other uh, labels or diagnoses. So there's uh, a few questions here. One of them is, um, uh, yeah, I guess you've started to respond to this, how, how you kind of differentiate between that. And I, I, like to, I was wondering if you could expand, expand a bit more when you talked about that actually, um, you know, uh, the, your res the, the response is what's important, no matter where the intersections are. Could you say a bit more about that in terms of, um, you know, uh, when, when you're perhaps not sure about, you know, um, what the child's experiencing it might be an effect of trauma or something else that's going on for them. Um, what is it that's most important for you in terms of how you're working with and responding to that child when you're in that place of not knowing? Of course, that's, that's a really fabulous question. And it's certainly something that we like to think with people regularly about. I think when we're looking at um, what's happening for a child, I'm most interested in a child's felt experience rather than looking for a diagnosis. And I think that's probably a framework that we use at the Australian Childhood Foundation is we're not seeking to diagnose, although diagnosis can be incredibly important and incredibly useful, but we're wanting to know what is life like for this child and what is the child's internal world. And if we can come from the perspective of what does this child need rather than what is a diagnosis, we can be connecting with the child and, and understanding what they need to feel safe. Because in order for any healing to happen, there needs to be safety. So if we're, mm. if we're reaching for a diagnosis or reaching for medication, we can miss opportunities for connection. And mm. if a child has, um, has got a diagnosis of ADHD, they, they need empathy, they need understanding, they need curiosity. If a, if a child has a diagnosis of autism, they, they might need something different. So it's about understanding what does this child need and seeing the child as an individual rather than seeing um, the symptom set. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, Catherine. So your theme of safety reminds me of a couple of other questions that have come through in relation to what if, um, or how, how to work with complex trauma where there remain kind of safety concerns in the home how to do that or to what extent is that possible even. Um, would, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear from both of you if you've got some thoughts about the, you know, how to work with complex trauma where safety is still a concern. And um, I guess that could well be the circumstances of many children, couldn't it? Yeah. It is. Um, I'll, I'll answer the question and then I'll hand over to Ali. I think um, for me, if I, was, if I was thinking about supporting a child who might be living in a situation that there are safety concerns, going into deep therapy may not be um, the right timing because in order for therapy to be safe, there needs to be safety. However, I might be looking at trying to resource the, the parent or the caregiver about 
what can they do to be supporting the child or what can they do to be increasing opportunities for safety and connection um, and looking at other agencies that might be able to resource the family um, mm. to, to help their safety. Mm. Great. Thanks. Can I just add to, to yeah, yeah. But, yeah, so Catherine, yeah, so I've great points there. I think um, for me, it's it's really it's a really good question and it's a very tricky um, place to sit. I think when you do have concerns about a child's safety and you're trying to be working with the family to support them to you know move forward and support their child, um, I think often it's really helpful if you're working in partnership with other um, professionals and you know you can have a bit of a care team around. Um, around the family. So, cause it's, it's often really difficult, I think, when you're sitting with a level of risk, when you're working with a family. Um, and so, I mean, I've um, worked in work contexts where we worked really closely, um, our service worked really closely with um, the child protection, the statutory child protection body. And so, um, you know, one thing we would do, for example, is have regular conversations about um, or with, you know, and the family were aware of these conversations taking place. Everyone was on the same page about what was happening. And if there were concerns, we'd be talking together and working as a bit of a team to how those would be addressed. So that um, that is really good, I think. So um, having a level of transparency around that. And, um, and so sometimes, you know, and just making sure that um, there's no kind of, um, yeah, sort of dangerous practice happening. So, and it's it's really um, um, you know works well for the the child in that in that context. So, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you both for that. There's, um, on that theme, or extending that theme even in a slightly different direction, there's a um, couple of questions around how can uh, support be provided for young children from um, refugee and migrant uh, communities as well, you know, who have experienced uh, complex trauma or who have continued to live in uh, difficult uh, circumstances. Yeah, there's special considerations in working with children from those um, those communities, yeah. When you hear that question, what sort of comes to mind for you in terms of some you know, key practice ideas or positioning for you, yeah, when working with kids from those communities? Do you want to start, Catherine, or shall I? <laughs> Um, maybe I'll just throw a few things out there. I mean, I guess this is, this is like an area of expertise for me, but um, I would all, always be wanting to sort of um, to be working in partnership with the family and, and learning about um, where they come from and what their experiences have been um, and, and not sort of um, and tr trying to be sensitive to that. Um, but I mean, I guess it comes down to, um, you know, thinking about the young child's sense of safety uh, and trying to, you know, build that up uh, in your work with the family. So, um, and I just was reminded of Catherine's point about, um, you know, just because a child is physically safe doesn't mean they feel emotionally safe. And so I guess that, that would ring true, I think, with a lot of um, children, young children who've had some very traumatic experiences and had to, um, you know, come to Australia and may not may not be feeling um, that sense of safety. So um, mm -hmm. I think just having having those sort of those those principles as you work with the family would be really really helpful. So mm. yeah, thanks, Ali. So I might just um, build on what Ali. Oh, sorry, Chris, I just cut you off. Um, I really like what what Ali said. Um, to build on that, I'd be looking at a systems approach and really wanting to um, include people um, that might have expertise in in um, multicultural mental health or refugee um, trauma counselling service in in your local state or territory. I would certainly be asking for advice from um, a service that did have expertise in working cross culturally, but. Um, I would also want him to be thinking about the relationship and the quality of relationship between the child and their primary caregiver. Because if we, you know, there may be a, a biological family member or it might be um, a foster carer or a kinship carer, but I'd really want him to be resourcing that relationship as well to increase the child's sense of safety. And mm -hmm. that might be um, also supporting the, the adult caregiver to be seeking their own appropriate mental health support as well. Mm. Mm. 
And that just made me think of another thing, Catherine, when you said that about, you know, my point in my presentation about a shared trauma experience that the family mm -hmm. might have had. So we just, I think, always need to be mindful of um, we're working with a, um, a family who've, ex you know, all experienced trauma um, and thinking about the child's needs within that context and being sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, um, someone's also asked a question, made a statement a, a bit about um, like the, pro the protective factors that are present as well in, um, in those, uh, the community from which the child is from, the refugee and um, migrant community as well, and perhaps really um, uh, has made that question or comment has me thinking a bit about um, uh, yeah, the different stories of survival and resilience and courage or whatever, you know, that are also circulating in those communities that can be really uh, sustained for children as well. So thanks for people, our contributors, <laughs> uh, participants as well. Um, Okay, um, we've got a uh, thank you so much, everyone, for the many questions you've sent in. Um, those we don't have time for, we'll be making a recording uh, to respond to those um, after the end of this webinar. We have got a, a, just a couple of minutes. Um, uh, there's a question about um, uh, how does trauma uh, uh, impact on children with uh, disabilities differently? And I'm guessing that might also be. Um, uh, influenced by the actual the disability and the particulars of that that the child is living with, I guess. But um, is there something you know, from your own experience that kind of again guides you in working with children who are living with a disability who have experiences of trauma as well in terms of what's most important for you to be mindful of or uh, uh, working from in terms of a position around that? Um, maybe I'll Absolutely. jump in. I just yeah <laughs> I think um for me it's just really um going back to uh, Catherine's point earlier about just trying to really get a good understanding of the actual the child and where they're at and you know that might be trying to um you know get a sense of their trauma experience but also where they're at in terms of their development and what the um impact of like the sort of intersection between the disability and the trauma so um and finding a way forward to work with um where the child's at for, so they can express, um, you know, express themselves in terms of what, what was their trauma. Uh, you know, with a lot of young children, um, they, they're not, you, I mentioned that there's, they'll be playing, playing out their experiences rather than talking. So that might be true mm -hmm. for a lot of um, children who've got a disability, you, you might have to be thinking about other ways so they can uh, be heard and understood and their story can, you know, as I mentioned about making meaning of their story uh, and just, mm -hmm. You have to get you have to get a bit creative sometimes, which um, children really respond to. They love working playfully and creatively. So um, I think that would be be my kind of thoughts on that. Terrific, thanks, Ellie. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, in fact, there was a couple of questions around um, play, and I know um, uh, yeah, you've both mentioned play is an important part of. Um, uh, are there any kind of, uh, there's a question around what types of play or conversation starters or emotional support tips or ideas mm. about that in, in the last minute? Is there something that immediately comes to mind for each of you around that that uh, practitioners could immediately draw on? I would um, um, encourage just... people to look at You go, Catherine. There you go, Ali. Um, I was just going to say, um, well, just qu quickly, um, the children, um, I think if you've got the right, if you've got some some toys um, that are trauma informed there um, and you put them in the space and give children an invitation, they will quite easily and quickly um, slip into play. It's a natural thing for children. It's how they learn. It's how they express themselves. And so having um, some basic um, toys, dollhouse and um you know, cooking stuff, a baby, toy animals, um, maybe some stuff which corresponds to their trauma experience, like the police or ambulance or things like that, and they will be able to express themselves um, and we'll, we'll sort of, the rest, you know, you don't need to do a lot. So um, that would be my kind of suggestion. It's just about setting it up and being there to support them with what they want to show you. Thanks, Helen. And um, completely agree. And I think if people are interested in further professional learning, I would encourage them to look at um, synergetic play therapy or dyadic developmental psychotherapy as um, really um, excellent trauma-informed um, frameworks for professional learning. 
but the greatest toy in the room is the therapist. So you don't need all the fancy bells and whistles. Um, you need to be child-centered and, and child-directed. Thank Good you. Point. That's from the, yeah, lovely uh, reminder yeah, for us to, uh, to be left with as we finish today. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today. Thanks so much, Ali and Catherine, and Trina as well for your contributions uh, to this webinar. Um, yeah, I really appreciated uh, diving into some of those uh, practice approaches and the uh, understandings that make that practice possible. So thank you all for that. Um, so folks, um, there will be a short feedback survey that will pop up when you exit the, uh, the webinar. That'd be terrific if you could uh, take a couple of minutes to complete that. That helps us get better at what we do here. And we'll, as I said, we'll continue to answer your questions uh, offline as well. And all of that will be posted on the CFDA and Emerging Minds uh, websites. And there is a replay of this, uh, this webinar next Wednesday as well. You would have received notification about that. Great. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. I look forward to uh, joining you again uh, next time. Thanks a lot. Okay. So, uh, Ali and Catherine will continue on now to uh, respond to some further questions that have been submitted by the um, webinar participants. And there's a question that reflects um, uh, a number of people's interest, actually, in working with Aboriginal families and uh, communities. And this person says, um, I work in the area of uh, child protection and constantly come up against attachment in Aboriginal families being different. And given the attachment relationship is so important, I often struggle to then make the link between different attachment relationships and trauma. Do you have any advice or particular considerations that need to be taken into account when working with Aboriginal children? And uh, yeah, really significant uh, question um, there. So uh, yeah, when you hear that person's experience and hear them ask the question, what sort of comes to mind for each of you in relation to that? I think for me, if I can just start, um, you know, I guess with Aboriginal families, there can be more of a community of care around, um, you know, bringing up children. So I, I guess I would want to explore who the significant relationships were for that child and then um, you know just think about those relationships so that it, there might not be just one primary caregiver there might be a number of caregivers which I guess makes the uh, picture a little bit more complicated potentially but I think we just need to be um, starting from that point and and just sort of you know engaging and working out who um, who's important in this child's life um, and yeah, I guess I, for me, it's just being open to learning about um, in different cultures how um, how children um, are cared for and what those relationships look like. So I think um, you know we just need to be sensitive to to differences in different cultures. And I, I don't um, think I'm an expert, so I would be wanting to um, you know draw on um, some cultural consultants in working with Aboriginal families and also the family themselves about being open to learning. And, you know, I think Catherine touched on this um, earlier about just, you know, every family we, we work with, we do learn something about, um, you know, children or families or culture. So I'm always really open to that, I think. Great. Yeah, thanks, Holly. Would you like to compliment that in some way, Catherine? Um, sure. And um, wholeheartedly agree with what Ali said. And I think to to add to that, I would be wanting to think about the experience of the family in a in a broader historical context in understanding um, generations that have come before the family that the practitioners work with in terms of their experience and what life has been like for them and their families and understanding how historical traumas might impact on quality of relationships and we, when we're working with um, people who have experienced trauma, we we really need to see them within context of their system and their history. And um, I must acknowledge that I am not an Aboriginal practitioner and I am not an expert in any way. Um, so I'd really be seeking advice and guidance from um, appropriate elders or Aboriginal health agencies, as Ali's mentioned. But we must acknowledge um, what is come before us um, in in context of colonization in context of the stolen generation 
Um, and we, we must consider how that is impacted on families that have come before. Um, so thinking more broadly than, than the, ch the individual child in this context would be um, something I would want to be considering, but also really wanting to explore what, what the child thinks and you know what what the what the caregivers think and and really looking to them to help me understand what life has been like for them and perhaps understanding you know you know can we make sense of their behavior or their attachment in the, in the context of what life has been like for them but very much being guided by um aboriginal health workers or um elders to, to help me understand as a non-Indigenous person, um, the historical context and, and also community context. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, Catherine. I think that context of um, inter, intergenerational cultural trauma is really important to be, be thinking about in any work with um, Aboriginal families, for sure, so. Yeah, um, I think um, what comes to mind for me in my earlier days and one of the most important lessons that I learned um, working in community um, was to not make assumptions and to ask and you know going back to the pace model of being curious and accepting and empathic and and not presuming that I am in any way expert in what life is like for this person um, so kind of really wanting to to um, work with not work for um, is really important. I think I just, um, yeah, I would, I would agree with it, Catherine. I just wanted to add, um, I think just it's really tricky work, working in the child protection space. Um, and we know that Aboriginal families are overrepresented and it is, uh, it does, um, I think it's really hard to get the balance right if you're a practitioner working in that space because you you don't want children to be at risk, um, but you know we're just aware of the the layers of, of the history uh, in terms of the stolen generation and um, just wanting to get it right, and that's a really tricky space to be in. So mm. I think I sort of see that in the the work I do uh, and I have done. There's just um, a struggle to and you know getting the balance right. I think, but just going into it with um, yeah an open mind and a curious mind, I think is a good place to start definitely um and i think um you've just triggered a thought for me ali about the importance of supervision mm. um and having access to really good supervision um to, to help the practitioner think through some of the complexities and 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 within supervision being able to acknowledge that the theories and structures that we use often do relate to western ideas and how might that translate to a cultural safety as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the point of cultural safety is really critical um, because I know um, just from my experience of working in a reunification service, um, you know, I guess I just was pretty conscious of what that's like for a Aboriginal family to step into that space. And it's, it was a child protection context as well. And just, um, you know, supporting, well, my aim was to try and support them to feel safe in that space, but that's, a, you know, it's a big ask for anyone, let alone um, when you've got those layers of potentially um, intergenerational trauma, cultural trauma. So I think it's a, a really difficult thing for, I, I imagine, for an Aboriginal family to step into that space. So um, trying to work out ways as a clinician, as an organisation that you can support um, and promote cultural safety is really important, I think, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, um, I think um, cultural humility training for any organisation is incredibly useful and I would say essential um, for, the, for your local context because we know that um, the experience and culture of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is vastly different across countries and communities and states and territories. So having access to cultural humility that's relevant for your um, local context is incredibly helpful. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah, thank you um, both of you for those um, responses. Um, yeah, so much to be um, 
being cognizant of, being mindful of, reflecting about in our practice. So thank you for that, responding to the question that way. We'll um, have a look at um, another question now that's, um, yes, again, uh, this question reflects a few others that were asked along similar lines, and it is, uh, can there be a delay in the presentation of responses to trauma? You know, for example, the person says, you know, responses to trauma experienced in early childhood first present in uh, teenage years or later. Is this possible or is this something that, um, yeah, you've noticed in your work with families, this, uh, this delay in presenting presentation? I think for, um, for me, I've certainly seen trauma present in different ways at different developmental stages. So, um, you know, for example, just thinking about, you know, your point about the teenage years, that certainly um, I think that's a, a, a quite a unique stage in development, isn't it, really, in terms of your identity, who am I, and and then having thinking about um, someone's trauma experience, or the, particularly if it's happened in the context of their family, can bring up a lot of different issues than you might see earlier. So I don't know if you found that, Catherine, in your your work, it's sort of it might pop up in different ways at different points in a child's life. Absolutely, and I, my mind goes to children who have had early childhood experience of trauma, or they might have had um, their birth parent. Um, experienced trauma during their pregnancy and I'm thinking particularly of children who might have grown up um, in a kinship placement or with a foster placement or may have been adopted and may not have had um, experiences that we would consider traumatic during early childhood but may have experienced trauma during the in utero period or very early in their childhood and, and then have had a I guess, um, a, a healthy childhood and then experience trauma in teenage years. And that can be incredibly challenging for parents um, or carers or um, foster carers to understand. And I think um, if we're thinking particularly around the changes in the brain for, for um, adolescents and coming into teenage years, that's, I would be really curious about understanding the context of neuro because around the age of 12 the brain starts to prune away parts that it doesn't need anymore um, in terms of um, skills or ideas or, or habits that it's not using and the brain can start to rewire itself and that's a, a period of rapid adaption and changes and that's why we see teens be so um, sometimes have big changes in their personality or big changes in their mood and they do start to we do start to see behaviour that's quite impulsive and there may be some trauma related behaviours that start to appear at that time and, and we can really understand that in the context of early childhood trauma and I think that my suggestion for anyone who is worried about a young person that um, that you might be seeing those changes with is to is to seek um, appropriate professional advice from a, a clinician, a mental health social worker or a psychologist that's got um, an interest in trauma um, and has done further training in trauma who will help the young person make sense of what's happening for them but also be able to help their parents or important adults to, to, to be supportive in helping that young person um, with these transitions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing I was just thinking about when you were talking, Catherine, was just about... Um, you know, the importance for um, for children who have been in care or kinship care or foster care for, you know, they might have been there since they were quite a young baby, but um, having a bit of a narrative around um, their early uh, experiences. And sometimes I think for children, um, they don't get that, uh, that opportunity to work in, in ther therapy setting around some of those early experiences, what, what happened to them. Um, because we know that the, the experiences are stored in the body, but then they don't have a narrative around it so it's like they haven't really um uh you know it, there's a bit of a mismatch i suppose that you know that their mind doesn't really um it's hard to put into words really but um it's 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 like putting the two together is really important i think for uh moving forward in a way that um promotes um, positive mental health so if you've got all this stuff stored in your body but you don't have um the words to express it 
it, there's a um, it's like there's a bit of a mismatch or something sort of not cohesive going on. So I would um, I, I'm a big fan of advocating for um, every um, child who's experienced trauma to have access to that early sort of therapeutic support, even if they seem to be tracking well, at, at, you know, early on. So I think that's yeah. really helpful. Uh, and then, you know, particularly you're moving into the teenage years and you've already had the opportunity to sort of make sense of things. And then you might need to be making sense of it again as your brain kind of develops and you've got more sort of mature, mature thinking. So mm -hmm. it's really important, I think. Yeah. And I think for, for any child who um, is in out-of-home care, um, it is incredibly helpful and useful for a child to have access to their their story of why they came into care in a really appropriate and child focused safe way, as Ali mentioned. And um, therapeutic life story work is a wonderful um, way to support children um, who are in out of home care. And depending on the um, the um, child safety practice, they may have a version of that for their individual um, local agency of how they would work with a child. But there's a there's a phrase then in, in um, that we use that you've got to name it to tame it. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about, Ali. Like we we have to be able to put words to our body experiences. And um, for some people who have experienced trauma, they don't know what their body feels like. So you, you need to kind of step back and start to be able to to be able to put words to their body based memories before they can integrate their their story. Mm. Yeah, I like. I hadn't heard that name. Name it. You've got to name it. To tame it. The other, the other um, way of uh, talking about that from child parent psychotherapy is uh, speaking the unspeakable, so putting words to those, you know, those experience of trauma. So it's the same kind of, kind mm. of thing. It's linking up, you know, your body experiences with a narrative. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've both uh, touched on a, a theme in relation to children in out of home care and in foster care, kinship care, which reflects a couple of questions as well that have come through. And um, in fact, one person has asked about, do you have any advice for when a child is in out of home care and the foster carers do, do not know about the trauma the child's experienced, you know, or understand the trauma the child has experienced? Is um, there something you'd like well, to add to what you've already said about that? Yeah. <laughs> definitely, they definitely, the foster parent really needs to know. Um, and so I've come across this quite a few times right. in my work where there's just been a, um, I suppose they haven't been given enough information. Um, and so it's really been a bit of a barrier because the foster parent needs to really have that information so they can make sense of the child's behaviours in the context of their trauma. So I would always advocate very strongly um, if I was working with uh, the child protection um, agency to be able to that to be shared. Uh, they really need to know um, everything um, to understand that fully. So um, it's critical, I think, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think in order to be able to hold compassion, we need to understand. And when we're seeing a child's trauma-based behaviours, which can be extraordinarily challenging, for an adult to stay regulated, we need to understand. So I think if, a, if the adult foster carer or kinship carer um, or even parent doesn't understand why, it's very challenging to hold compassion. And when you can't hold compassion, you're likely to respond from, from your own dysregulation. Because if a, if a child is, is being very challenging in their behaviour or, or using really big behaviours to show them, the adult, how distressed or dysregulated they are, the adult needs all the skills and opportunities and information to be able to support that child. So I completely agree with what Ali has said. I think depending on the age of the child, the child or young person really needs to have a voice that, of how that story is shared. And, um, you know, do they want to sit at that table or would, would the child protection officer talk to the carer or so on? So I think it's really, you know, important to, to think about from a child-focused way. Um, but I completely agree with what Ali said. Yes, it's, uh, there's some questions around, um, you know, foster carers or parents uh, responding to challenging behaviour and, um, 
um, I really appreciate your phrase around holding on to compassion and so having an understanding of um, the child's what the child's uh, experienced can can, su can support that holding on to compassion I guess in terms of um, supporting the parent or carer to respond in a way that they prefer to be responding rather than other things getting the better of them I guess mm -hmm. and also I suppose you know just for the parent or carer understanding their response um, you know the and putting into context so if they're responding in a way that's quite harsh for example um, like being able to think uh, in the therapeutic space about what's going on there and is that something about my own kind of experiences that have been touched on and and it you know it goes back to the the concept of ghosts in the nursery sometimes that need a bit of gentle exploration um, to sort of to make to sort of support that that uh, foster parent to be able to um, really be able to respond in a way the child needs so mm -hmm. that's pretty important I think too and, um, I think it's it's so important to remember who's there at 3 a.m with the child and you know when when we're thinking as professionals um, about supporting a child or a young person who who's going to be there at 3 a.m when the child's distressed or dysregulated um, and adults aren't their best selves at 3 a.m generally a um, few exceptions I'm sure but if we can support the adult to to really understand the child's needs and that these behaviours are because of unmet need it can change the adult's capacity to respond in a therapeutic way. Thank you yeah we need to finish shortly thanks for your time but I did want to kind of um, bring in another question uh, that people have asked and it kind of um, uh, builds on uh, something you've said, um, Catherine, in relation to, um, you know, giving children a choice where they seat it, if they're seated at the table and how, what they get to say about their own experience. And so the, the question is about how can we increase the child's voice in our practice? Really? Mm. And I guess there's a multitude of ways, isn't there? There um, is. Yeah, but, in, but um, to respond to that question, you know, are there a couple of key ideas or ways that you really seek to ensure that children are having a voice having a say in the work you're doing with them? I think um, children have got lots of ways to be able to to give us feedback but for them to be able to give us authentic feedback for them we need to have relationships and we need to have relational safety so I think it's about thinking about who is the best person in the child's life or young person's life to give feedback to. There are some really beautiful um, feedback tools for younger children and adolescents and teens um, through the Australian Childhood Foundation. It's a child feedback toolkit, which is some really beautiful ways to gather feedback. But um, I think being really um, developmentally appropriate of how you ask questions, depending on the child's age, um, they can draw something or they can explain it or they, you know, we have young people that write songs um, about their experience and some young people and children come to their care team meetings. I think it's about seeing where the child is at, asking them um, and giving them options to participate or not, but it's got to be the right person asking them in terms of who's got the safest relationship. Ali, is yeah, definitely. To add to that? Um, I suppose I was just thinking about um, my work with you know babies and very young children so it's you know they're not going to really be able to um, you know maybe give you feedback in um, in a couple of sentences or that kind of thing but they I think for me it's about trying to understand um, for a young child what their behavior is showing us and making sense of that in the context of with the parent or the foster parent whoever it is and um, sometimes we've had to really think carefully about what children are, are telling us if if they're showing some very distressed behaviours, what does that mean? And um, how can we support them um, with that message that they're communicating and really just looking carefully about that and thinking about that in the context of their trauma and their key relationships. So um, you do kind of need to be um, sometimes, um, yeah, just trying to sort of, this, this, this child's telling me something very strongly here and I think we need to be listening and we act need to be acting on it. So. 
it's a little bit trickier, I think, when you're working with a baby or a young child because they, they've got their behaviours and they, they can cry. You know, there's, there's limited ways they can show us. So we really need to look carefully and listen carefully to those things that are happening. Terrific, yeah. Great. Well, we must finish there. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine and Ali, for uh, your presentations and for your um, uh, responses to questions from the webinar participants. Yeah, I've really appreciate um, yeah, hearing some of your reflections on those things. So uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.